Pink Cloud Radio 76. Now, in this whole thing of haberdashery and everything else, because we're all involved here, because I don't have anything else really to proclaim to, to, to show you that I'm not insane. Because really, you know, being not afraid of death and not afraid of love isn't really a tech isn't really attractive to many because you know well it's healthy too well, it's not really healthy nothing in that kind of attitude is really healthy just to get the upper hand as i ended with last time because i mean technically if you let something get the upper hand in your life is that good you know whether it's something you know, living, whether it's something there, whether it's something, an object, or stuff like that, to have it, to let it have the upper hand isn't really like, hey, that's a great thing. <laughs> I think, in a lot of ways, people use that to manipulate situations sometimes. Because, see, the thing about being bad, being evil, is not really like, I choose to be. It's more like, here it is, you take it. Meaning that you just take it in and that's it. You don't have anything else to worry about because that's it. Right there, you have it. You have everything decided at one point. <clears throat> and it's not bigger, it's not badder, it's not anything else. It's just that is what is your point. And I think that's what really is the meaning of, you know, just getting the upper hand. You know, that's all it is about, really, in that way. Because it doesn't really show, like, if... Like when people say that, oh, well, you're just trying to get the upper hand then. Like, it may be the opposite, where you show them, hey, you're just trying to get the upper hand now, but I'm not. It doesn't mean that I'm, you know, thinking of things in a certain way. It just means that there's no possible way I could just want to get the upper hand. Because I've been there before. And it's not something I personally would want, you know. You know, trial and error. You know, it's not even about trial and error at that point. I already know that I don't want that. That's it. You know, there's nothing, you know, higher or lower than that. You know, when you know what you don't want to be, the kind of person you don't want to be, it's not really even about looking at it and saying, ooh, look at that disgusting thing. No, it's just, you would never think that way. It's, it's, it's like, see, like me talking about everything. The kind of persons that have been in these 76 uh, pink clouds. But also in the fact that I've done the recordings before. Thousands of them. But the fact is, all this stuff hasn't made me think that way. Even unconsciously. In fact, unconsciously, I'm speaking more prevalent now unconsciously because this is all who I am outside of this realm of the world that we want to call it. And I think that's what I kind of get when I hear, you know, just to get the upper hand. It's like... You know, the last note of life, you know. But what what else is living, you know? It's not really about, you know, the fact that somebody else would have power over you because they do or don't. It's just that there's something else there that you're missing and you don't want to see. Maybe that's why, you know. It's the same thing that goes with God Save the System. One of my favorites. God Save the System. Should not... God, uh, should not God be saving the people? Not about anything that man created? When I think about, like, when people say God saved the system, I think, like, would any rather save the people, not the system? If he's worried about the system, not no God of mine. You know, I don't care about the system, you know. I don't care about the civilization or the society. I care about the people. You know, and at the end of the day, that's what matters to me. You know, it's pretty sad when people proclaim God saved the system. The hell? You want him to save a system that hurts humans? Really? Because, literally, you can hurt more than you can save with the system that we have. Not to say that there's a system that doesn't do that. Any human system would never do that, because most human systems are based on the architect of engineers. Engineers that, you know, confidently know how to manipulate the market. Manipulate it for their advantage, and for everybody else's advantage, when they want to give it to them. It's a choice, yes. And it is, you know. Like, just like the Electoral College. You know, they they pick and choose who they want. You know, well, we pick it with, based on the votes that are taken. Doesn't have to be true, actually. And I don't even need to go back to Al Gore to prove that. I can go even further, go further back. But, you know, as uh, FDR said, uh, presidents are chosen, not uh, elected. 
It's true. If FDR said it, you know, then he obviously knows where he was. You know, it's true. You know, it's kind of crazy that people have spoken out that have been on the other the other side of it, and then saw the wrong ways. But at the same time, it doesn't change the wrong ways. You know, it's the same thing of looking at you know the idea of God save the system right there is that if you truly want God to save the system, why? Well, why do you care? You know what God has said. But to be fair, God has said many things about revenge and bullying. Do unto others as, as others do unto you? Well, that's bullying. That's not, you know, it actually sets up the manner of bullying and revenge. It doesn't set up a manner of, let's be kind to people. No, it means that most people will take advantage and start hurting people continuously. An onslaught almost, you know. It's funny how people swear that God can do can do so, you know. And at the same time, create the idea of an all-loving and trusting government. It's hilarious, you know. I think it's funny how people swear that God can do so, you know, that God saved the system, and at the same time create the idea of an all-loving and trusting government. Well, you can't have both, you know. If you, if you need God to save the system, then there must be wrong with the system that's not loving and trusting. So if you need God to come in and, you know, place himself in the middle of it, then there's something wrong with the people in the system right there, especially in the government right there. But... You know, you can't have both. Of course, humans are the biggest contradiction machines. And animals aren't, you know. When they go to the bathroom, they go to the bathroom. When they live in nature, they just live in nature. They don't contradict themselves and go, you know, can I live in your house? You know, it doesn't mean it doesn't happen because there's a lot of people, a lot of stuff that leads animals to different areas. Whether it's global, you know, eco-terrorism or just the fact that, you know, we destroy a ton of different... You know, we as humans destroy a lot of, uh, basically, forest and everything. Deforestation everywhere. The What are the animals going to do? Not live? They're going to try to survive just as much as humans can, you know. It's not about survival of the fittest, it's about survival at all. Are you going to try to survive? Most likely you would. I think all, all of you out there would, in some form or another, listeners. If you wouldn't like to, then you obviously don't have any reason to listen to me. <laughs> You know, and you wouldn't because, you know, like you said, God saved the system. Yet you swear that God will do so. But then why at the same time would you believe in such a loving and trusting government? You know, one has to be wrong. You can't have both being right. But see, that's the thing about politics and television media and news and everything in general. You let both things be true. So that, guess which one wins out? The one that doesn't sound so bad. That's what happens, you know, as with Edward Snowden. Well, no, I believe what President Obama said on Jay Leno, where, you know, the NSA isn't doing that sort of stuff. But Edward Snowden proved it. Well, I want him dead. So you want a guy who proved the president wrong after he, he already showed the evidence, then the president said, no, that's not true. But the evidence is right there, but you don't care about the evidence right there because even the truth right in your face will still let you go for the lie because it's comforting. The lie is comforting, of course, because there's no, there's no added appendages of anything for you for work to do. If you just believe the person that's going to keep it the same, oh, good, there's somebody there that wants to actually keep it the same. Woo! No problems at all. God save the system. You know, I hope God crushes the system, to be honest, and he is, but we're doing it for him, you know. God doesn't need to do a single thing at this point, you know, if I look at it in that perspective. It literally means that God doesn't need to do anything. We're doing it ourselves, you know. Because it sounds like, in point in fact, when people say that, that somehow only humans can mess this up. But at the same time, humans can't fix it. Well, then that doesn't make sense to trust the government or love your government. Because right there, any systematic conjuring that humans make in any aspect, of creating some sort of global dominance or dominance in any territory would already show that they can't be loved or they can't be trusted if they have to use it that way. There has to be some reason behind it. Not to say that, oh, it doesn't mean everybody has some bad reason to do everything. Who says it doesn't? You think, you think somebody's going to admit to you, well, yes, I'm here to take over everything and treat you, and treat you bad. 
Yeah, you really think people will admit that kind of stuff. If they did, one, it wouldn't work out, as with the Federal Reserve Bank. The Federal Reserve Bank two times lasted 20 years and was stopped by the people because they saw that the corporations and banks took over everything. And they said, no, thank you. Shut it down. Both times. The third time it came up in, 19, in 1907, they went secretly to Jekyll Island to make it, you know, to make the law, to make up everything about it and put it in. But it was still the corporations and banks that were, you know, setting it up. People in the top positions writing it up. So if they did that in public, people would be like, oh, no, thank you. But since they did it in private, everybody's okay. Because, oh, no, we could trust them. Well, you have no... You have no way of turning your back now because it already was passed for one. So right there and then you have the identity of what people will agree with and not agree with. They'll agree with something as long as they don't know about it. As long as there's a as long as the other person tried to not let them know about it, it's all right. <laughs> so as long as somebody tried to not let you know about something, it's all right. I don't care about the person who actually did, Edward Snowden. But at least there are other people that don't want me to know about it at all and let me live in my ignorance. So, I mean, you feel better because of that, because there's somebody on your side. See, there's not many on this side or Edward Snowden's side, for example, because if there was, one, there would be a lot many more people coming out and saying NSA is treating people like shit. You know, most people aren't a glutton for punishment in that form. They won't, they'll never do it alone. They always do it in a relationship, an abusive relationship, and try to stay in the relationship. Most people don't try to get out of something and do it ab abusively. You can't abuse yourself and get out of something. It means that you actually are trying to actually make something good and concrete in life. You know, it shouldn't be a surprise, but it is to most people because most people like to live in that imagination world. Well, if you have to create an imagination, as the communist would have said, it means that your reality isn't so good. <laughs> And it's true, you know, it's true. If you have to have that entertainment, that stuff around you, it means that something in your reality is not, is not so good and well done. <laughs> I kind of have to agree with that, you know. There has to be something there that's not, that's not fulfilling. And if that's a fact, then there's something else above that that's hitting you hard. Hitting you hard. But I think... That's the whole point of me working at McDonald's, for example. I think this is just a little leeway I'm going to make. It's something I never expected. You know, when I started working there in 2003, I didn't say, you know, I didn't think, oh, I'm going to work here forever. I didn't think that way right away at all. But it didn't even grow on me. It was the fact that what I knew, what I saw, what I was there, it mattered. I don't see that much anywhere else. Just to be fair with you, all of you, I don't see that much anywhere else. And that's sad, because I could go to school and talk in a classroom, you know, meaning that I could be a student, as I was, and talk, and it just doesn't have any really big value. You know, I talk deeply, you know, as with this. And I'm not saying it doesn't count ever. It does. Especially when you can make a really good point with something that's very short and simple. But I don't think my things are short and simple at all. <laughs> I was reading uh, the Wizard of Oz book, the past, I, I forgot which one I was reading, but one of them was about this place where people kept on talking, didn't, get, didn't answer anything, but just kept on talking because yes and no's weren't good, in one of the lines, and it was hilarious, because I think that's really the point of life, is that it's not really about saying yes or no, but see, that's the thing about where it doesn't work, some of that stuff does work everywhere. But it doesn't work anywhere, you know, meaning that the things that we do have here in our system is built on a concrete thing, meaning that anybody can now do anything that's in a high position, because if people think in that way, that it's okay for people up top to do it, then they'll always be taken advantage of, and they'll try to, the only thing they'll ever do is that they'll try to get to that level and do the same thing to people below them, especially if they were in that kind of position before too, because now I can do it to other people, that, like they did it to me, well, hold on. That's when I think taking your full steam of what you want, you should take it out when you're actually down at the bottom on the people up top. You shouldn't be waiting until you get to the top and then take it down on, on the people that, that you, you know, if you were in their shoes, which you were, you don't care. Exactly. And you don't. 
And I think that's really what has happened. You know, it's like insulting my intelligence. Here's another favorite of mine. Um, you can't very well do that if you're not intelligent. <laughs> you know, you're insulting my intelligence. Well, uh, you can't really do that if you're not intelligent. You know, even if you're intelligent, uh, quotations there, uh, that may come out uh, of uh, as a self-defense mechanism, sarcasm, cynicism, to avoid a conversation uh, or information does not insult my intelligence. It, ins it insults your own. You know, don't insult my intelligence with that kind of, uh, you know, information or evidence. You're insulting your own intelligence because you're avoiding it. You know, it has nothing to do with me giving it to you. And it's the whole idea. It is truly about that. You know, most people like blaming the messenger for the evidence. But the evidence was already there. You know, as much as Edward Snowden was talked about, this stuff has happened before. This stuff was talked about and shown before to the public. Now it just has a messenger with it. That's all. It doesn't mean the messenger is more important than it or not. It's the information, but they never plugged that in the news. The information that was plugged, very hardly little. They mostly talked about him. Yeah, you know, a guy gutsy enough to give up his whole lifestyle here on, on this earth to help other people actually have their individual human life back. Yeah. Of course, that counts for nothing, <laughs> because you don't want to be an individual, so it's easy, you know. It's easy to admit defeat, very easy to admit defeat, especially when you think you can get a crown jewel because of it, because most people believe they can get something out of it if they disagree, ass, kiss, brown nose, whatever you want to call it. That kind of stuff gets you places, right? But at the same time, your self-defense mechanism does that too, sarcasm, cynicism, you know, just to avoid what somebody's bringing to you, you just make fun of it. As with Joe Rogan's Question Everything. If any of you have seen that, well, I, honestly, I used to respect him for his comedy before because I saw his comedy before and I saw him actually talk about deep issues. And now he just sits there, makes monkey faces, you know, to be fair, and calls out people like a joke. So it's kind of a useless print, and he defends people that debunk conspiracies by creating websites and having so much free time on their, and that's it. It doesn't mean they have any PhD, anything else like that. That doesn't matter. All these other guys who are actually trying to prove the conspiracies to be facts, to have facts behind it, evidence behind it, are laughed off, you know, not laughed off the set, but made fun of and said, oh, here are those conspiracies. Don't even listen to the person. Just make weird faces. You're, you're pretty much an asshole like everybody else, Joe. But you're a tool, an apathetic tool, to be exact, because if you truly cared about humans, you wouldn't discredit one and enhance another. <laughs> Especially if you're trying to take it as questioning everything. If you're not, that means you're just an asshole brought up to treat everybody like an asshole. There you go. <laughs> but I think that's a lot of people's missions with, with their, what they give in their lives. They give in their lives everything, so they expect to get everything. No, you don't. You didn't, you didn't give all your passion. I'm sorry. If you actually gave everything, you wouldn't be at this menial job doing nothing and, and acting like you love it, but not loving it. Actually being bitter about it. Being bitter about being kind to people when you don't get anything in return. So, um, also not losing weight, but not losing weight. Not because, you know, it matters. More because you want to keep yourself in this mode because you want to see if anybody cares about you in this position. Well, guess what? If you're asking for stuff when you're doing something, you're not really doing it for the luxury of doing it. You're doing it because you want something in return. So in all those cases, when I speak of it that way, this is the kind of trajectory that comes out. You're insulting your own intelligence at that point. If you're so smart, stop putting yourself down. <laughs> there you go. If you're so smart, stop putting everybody else down. It's as simple as that. But it's not as simple as that for a lot of people because a lot of people are used to the fact. A lot of people are used to the fact. And I think that's what makes it easy on a lot of people. They always uh, make it easy on themselves to do it that way, you know. And I think that's what I meant by, you know, just to get the upper hand, you know. That's what counts, you know. Who's, who, who actually gets Nobel Peace Prizes? Who actually gets all this other stuff? Well, it's not people who actually do kind, good acts. 
It's more people that actually just listen to the rules and do what they're told. That's who gets a Nobel Peace Prize. Hey, don't upset the system. You know. But the people who have hardly have gotten it, to be matter of factly. And to be even more honest about it, most of the people who did get it were dead. So to get a Nobel Peace Prize after you die is not really a credit to the person. It's not. You know, they're dead. They obviously have nothing to gain from what they do now because they've been stopped. Because, and I think that's what a lot of people, they try to amount to the struggle by saying that what the struggle, what struggle was there is gone now because the person's dead. Well, if you truly think the struggle is over, then you weren't really listening to the person <laughs> because they talked about more than just uh, race, color, and creed. Like, it's like the news, you know, recently talking about Paula Dean and everything. Well, if she's a racist, she can be a racist. I'm not telling her. It's just like anybody. If they want to be a racist, they can be. It doesn't mean everybody else is or anybody else can be influenced by them. If they are, they're stupid. You know, they're stupid because they're getting influenced by other people. And I think that's the problem that we have. If, if people think they're so weak-minded, well, then why don't you just try to teach them? Well, then why don't, wouldn't you believe that our government or the power elite couldn't subliminally couldn't subliminally, consciously have uh, or unconsciously have some kind of control over us. Because if we're so weak-minded to believe that Paula Dean can change the world from her racism, then you, would, then you should believe the opposite, too. That somebody in a high position can do something to do a lot worse damage to the lower, like the old brazen bull story. But I don't think a lot of people want to you know, negotiate that because then it's harder to face the facts, so the, the irrevocable... The, Irre equivoc irrevocable consequences of it, meaning that they'll have to deal with the consequences of what their government and their people in general have done right in front of their eyes, and they believe the lies. So they want to keep believing the lies because then they don't have to deal with the consequences. It's easier to groupthink. Much easier to groupthink because then you don't have anything else to worry about. There's somebody always there around you that thinks the same way as you. Me, on the other hand, no. <laughs> My representative party, myself. <laughs> My music I listen to, uh, just Marcello's list. I add to the list, but I don't go off the list. It doesn't mean I don't necessarily go off the list to add more, because I do. But I don't go off the list when I'm begging for something. I'm begging for the same things, usually. Um, and those kind of things are really about, you know, just forgetting about the upper hand at all. You know, it's the a great example was I was watching Charmed recently. And one of the episodes was about... You know, a guy, uh, a newspaper article writer, who saw one of the, you know, one of the girls doing her magical powers, and tried to use it against her, and saying, "I can make you a hero, or I can make you the worst thing ever." Right there, if you're willing to sacrifice and maim and control the kind of people that are around you, and say if they're good or bad, you know, and people can say the same thing to me about the government in general, but there's evidence to back up that claim. You know, it's a whole idea of people saying that, well, somebody would have said something. But what if all those people were told the same thing? They weren't told all this. You know, what if this evidence has come out and it's even a shock to them? What about that? You know, well, you can't really say that all these other people knew. I don't even, I don't even think they knew. I think they were told what to believe about it. Just like we were. If they weren't, they would have stood up and done something about it already. They wouldn't have waited till now. And the people who have spoken up were actually at the event itself and experienced it. They weren't people in, you know, in some other, in, in Washington, D.C., hey, well, I know about this. They're too scared. They're not willing to risk their lives for a truth for humans, you know. But it's not about humans, it's about them, you know. Are you willing to face the truth about yourself? You know, that's the thing that I'd say to all of you out there. Are you willing to face the truth about yourself and be honest with yourself? Or are you not? From what I see in the world, no. And I'm not even talking about America. Everywhere. Because if the rest of the world was at all concrete, meaning that if they were able to deal with things directly in their whole sphere of who they are, they would have done so already. Meaning that they would have stood up to America, they would have stood up to all these things. But the thing is, they're all manipulated. They're all of them, you know. Even the ones that are supposedly our enemies. <laughs> We've slept with them enough, ladies and gentlemen. 
We just don't want copycats. There's a big difference. That's why any of them are enemies, because no, we're the only ones that we could trade with terrorists, you know, fund the terrorists in Syria, make it look like uh, they had the chemical weapons, even though in January it was, you know, it was a big news article that we actually gave it to them. Sold them the chemical weapons, as the military industrial complex does, sells to the enemies and the friends, <laughs> because they're all friends in the mix. You fund both sides, you get everybody to die. You know, what's the worst that can happen? All we say is we feel sorry for them. Oh, well, we lost our lives here. <laughs> Good. And that's the under the breath, of course. But, you know, nobody wants to believe that because, as usual, humans are capable of so much good. Well, I can say humans are capable of so much bad because I've seen it a lot more. It doesn't mean humans aren't capable of good. It means that stop living in the hope that humans are capable of so much good. Use something that's more realistic, meaning that at least look at it directly. I may be grim, but I'm positive about it. You know, and it means that I'm looking at the grim reality. That's the only way you can change things. You can't change things by look, by creating an imagination. Obviously, it hasn't worked. We've been with movies for over a hundred years now. Hasn't changed a do goddamn thing. Music even longer. Composers from the 1700s. We're talking decades. We're talking uh, centuries. You know, whole whole millennia. But it really doesn't matter. Because those things, entertainment, the kind of sludge, the material substance hasn't done anything to change it. It's changed some attitudes, some root causes, but the root cause hasn't been gone. Meaning that the root cause, it's the whole idea of what Plato said, you know, as, as you know, the tyrant will keep on saying, that's the enemy, that's the enemy, that's the enemy, until the end of time. Because Tyrants don't end their reign of terror. You know, we can say all we want that, you know, the reign of terror comes from the outside. The reign of terror comes everywhere. If you truly want to stop it, stop stop trying to control people. There you go. It's a pretty simple answer. But as long as you do that, you're not going to get people to feel, <laughs> I guess, the ones that are insecure, to feel safe. And I think that's what really is the matter here, that most people don't want to deal with that. And, you know, it's the whole idea of what the self-defense mechanism, sarcasm, and cynicism are. It's the void of conversation or information. You know, it doesn't insult my intelligence because I'm the one looking at it. If you want to insult my intelligence, go ahead. But you're not really insulting mine, you're insulting your own. Because you're looking, you're, you've, already, you've already insulted your intelligence enough by saying you don't even want to look at the subject. Well, you don't have any, you really aren't somebody who's very curious in science. I don't know, you know, for example, if it was somebody who said that, I would say you're not much of a scientist because you would look at everything. You know, even something that is uh, not directly in the, in the science fabric of what we've created. Because there's been a lot of science that's been denied votes, that was voted on democratically and kicked out. It doesn't mean that science is wrong. They could have, they manipulate the figures all the time to make one look bad, the other look good. Because they they don't want a lot of science in the world. You know why? Because most a lot of science proves free energy and uses free energy, as Tesla used. But it was voted down because investments were a lot more for Edison. Good old Edison, able to buy the most patents in the world. Not actually inventing anything, mostly just buying. <laughs> And stealing a lot of his ideas, stealing a lot of people's ideas, and just buying and buying the uh, patents for them. That's all. That's all he did. Not much of a, not much of a guy. A good sales pitch, man. Not much of anything else, though. <laughs> An inventor? Eh, I wish. <laughs> Sadly, most of the people we look at as our inventors in, in the in the history and hewn fabric of the world that actually created things are just mess are just uh, toolboxes that just did everything the right way. Some didn't. And they're respected for it, but they died. <laughs> and they were treated like shit in their lifetime. wonder why Edison wasn't. Oh, because he listened to everybody. And he did it for the investors. He made sure the investors were happy. Including himself. <laughs> um, and uh, Tesla? Nope. No thanks. He proved it more than once, though. Oh, man, the guy... He proved it on a huge scale, too. He said, I'm going to prove this. He did it with huge appliances. What? 
Oh man, I can't even remember a lot of them, but the experience the experiments that he did it did the work. So that's what you get for your self defense mechanism, your sarcasm, your cynicism, to avoid a conversation or information. You insult your own intelligence. But hey, I can't stand in your way. You got you got a lot to insult, I guess, about your intelligence, and I can understand. Especially feeling especially treating things that way. Uh, I could definitely understand why you would insult your intelligence. I'd feel like I'd want to as well. You know, it's impossible for th for this world we live in to empathize with others, but we can always empathize with ourselves. There we go, guys. That's a big one. Heard it in American Psycho. Read it in there too, actually. But um, to be fair, it's true. It's not a lie. He's uh, right about that. It's it's hard in this world to empathize with others, but it's mostly because most people don't empathize with themselves. It's not that people aren't able to empathize, it's that if they don't spend the time empathizing with themselves, there's not really going to be uh, an understanding to empathize with others, even if they had tried, you know. It's, it's really about, like, what I said already, that, you know, I've tried to empathize with others and they hated it. Hey, don't get in my mind. Hey, I can't read your mind. There's stuff like that, on and on and on. But it isn't about that, you know, it's about the fact that if you're using something that you personally are holding a vedetta against or have some sort of problem with, and you're not saying that directly, then how do you expect somebody to feel good about that, you know? I, you know, this person's a really great person. They used uh, me not doing anything against me. So that sounds like they're a really great person, uh, very good friend, <laughs> you know? It's that idea of like, I can do that to you, but wait a minute, you can't do that to me. You know, It's the expectations again. And I really think that's what this really is. It's, it's what I mean by, you know, we, got, we can't empathize with others because truly they have too much expectations. They expect you to, you know, completely, you know, validify everything about them, but there's no possible way unless they empathize with themselves and understand that your empathy is there. You know, if they don't understand what empathy is because they've never done it to them for themselves, then they'll never appreciate, truly appreciate something. I appreciate everything, even shit. <laughs> Meaning that if people treat me like shit, I appreciate it. <laughs> but, you know, it's it's kind of an off-color joke, but it is true. I mean, literally, there's nothing else I can do. I can try to assimilate some sort of character and bet, you know, say I'm not going to fucking back down with this shit. But it doesn't mean anything. Because truly, that idea, compromise, get out of the way. You know, to me, I think that's what really fighting is. Fighting to me is more like that. It's just compromise. It's dealing with something and saying, I'm just going to do it anyway. What's the fucking point then? Don't you want to prove not to be better, but don't you want to prove what you feel? You know, that's why I haven't gotten in a fight or anything, or that's why I haven't stayed in a relationship where it was abusive, or I was treated like a punching bag. Because I saw that that wasn't the kind of relationship that made sense to me. Doesn't make sense to me. Maybe to a lot of people it does. At least you have somebody, right? <laughs> but see, that's the thing. If it's about at least, then what's the point? I don't want at least. I want a little more than that. I'm not asking for, you know, a certain type of woman, how she looks. No. I'm not asking for a certain kind of thing of like, hey, you gotta be my, you gotta be my slave. You know? No. But we can always empathize with ourselves. And we can. We can. You know, as long as you empathize with yourself, you're using the right step, you're using the right motion, because you're not going to ask anybody for anything for your own personal needs. Because your personal needs, aside, are bigger. You know, what you can do is more than what you want, want, want done to you. But I think it's all important. I just think that what you what you would receive is what you give too so if you're giving love you should be getting love if you're not then maybe you're you know I'm not blaming you for it because possibly you are giving love but nobody else like I said if nobody else is empathizing with themselves they have no way of showing that kind of love to you and I'm, I'm not saying that you have to be understanding because a lot of people in this world you know worship Moloch <laughs> okay when it comes down to it, and that's somebody who, you know, shows you how to get rid of all that care. 
So you don't care about anything, about anyone. But I've seen a lot of people say they are misanthropic and apathetic. But at the end of the day, they can't, end a conver they can't even make a conversation to prove it. All they do is go around the subject. They, they say they're misanthropic and apathetic, but they never truly are. Because one at a time, they fall back to the dismal things that everybody, every other human is doing. So it means that they're falling into a pattern of saying they hate humans, but they'd rather it stay the same than try to change. Then literally, right there and then, that's what is that hope and change everybody was asking for. It was, I want everything to stay the same. That's the hope and change they wanted. They didn't want anything different. If they truly did, they wouldn't be happy with the president. They wouldn't be happy with the world as it is. But they are. Because they're happy that they can live in that lie for a little bit longer. As with the Roman Empire too. It happened the same way. You know, a lot of people just lived in it until the misery blew over and everything was dead. It was easier for them, you know, because at least they had that. They ended with something at least, something of value. But there's nothing of value after it's all gone. And you've you basically valued something that's valueless because it has no value for you. Like... That's why I personally don't see any value in the government. Because they don't see any value in me. I'm not saying I should give it right back to them and not value them, but to trust them and to love them. To use it in that way, they don't even deserve my hate. <laughs> there you go. And to be fair with you, this isn't about hate. I just don't trust them. But it doesn't mean I'm going to live my entire predictive daily routine in thinking about it and you know discrediting it and, and turning it and turning it like some kind of, you know, beastly circle that keeps going around. I just know that it wouldn't matter to really value what they give us when this, when, with how much they've taken. That's what you look at. You don't look at what people give you. You should always look at what they take. Because what they take shows a lot more about the kind of person they are, what kind of persons they are, than what they actually give people. Giving them a word, giving them a way to rise an awareness means very little if that awareness only shows how much you're going to take in return. There you go. And I think that's why what I mean when I say about empathy, you know, we can't empathize with others. If all you want is, is what you want, you, I can't really empathize with that. I mean, how much more, what can I say? You know, I want things too. Oh, it's great empathy. There we go. And I think that's why it's so easy to get friends sometimes because some people are that, you know, naive in that way where it's like, this guy's my best friend right here because he wants things. Okay, who doesn't? <laughs> who doesn't, you know? It's kind of a joke when it comes down to it because if that's all that matters is the value of whether you want things or not <laughs> I mean how much of a friendship can you have and I think that's what really happened between a lot of my friendships in the past I'm grateful for them but I'm pretty sure that's why they ended because they wanted things at times where uh, I couldn't give it to them and that's good because I'm glad that that really showed their kind of character that they leave you because they can't get what they want well then you don't really want me around because if you did you wouldn't always be, th you know, you wouldn't use that as a means to get out of it. Because you would, sh you would show your true colors and, you know, you would show some other true colors and say, Hey, no, I do value you for who you are. I know that I wanted something, but I don't want to, you know. And I think that's why people always say, I know I couldn't get what I wanted. You know, and they try to make it seem like, well, I'm not going to try that again. But I think that's an asshole move too. Because it's like saying that, you know, I didn't get what I wanted, so I'm not even going to try anymore. Uh-uh. You know, where people... It's not even about giving up at that point. It's about if they can't get it the way they want it, they're not going to try it anymore. Right there. And it goes back to, you know, wanting somebody to change for them. Or two, uh, wanting somebody to empathize with them when they don't empathize with themselves. I can't show you anything that you can't show yourself. It's true, you know. And that's the biggest line right there. I can't show you anything that you can't show yourself. I mean, that's what it comes down to with this whole thing. With what I've been talking about for years, really. I could never show you anything that you can't show yourself. And I think that's what I mean by everything being in that empathy. You know, if you don't give yourself empathy, what are you going to give yourself? Only the things you want. 
well, then that's not going to get you much because then you're going to be bitter. You're going to use your emotions, emotional outburst, in in the way of saying that I'm too sensitive for this. No, you're not. You're not that sensitive. I'm sensitive, and I'm not too sensitive for anything. You could throw me anything, and it wouldn't be too sensitive for me because I'm not going to get too sensitive about it because I know that what I can get is what I can give. And at the end of the day, that's what's going to concern me. It's not going to concern me whether or not, hey, you know, I got my girl here. Because to me, and it goes back to what a lot of people have had problems with in, in this generation. Well, don't hang out with those girls anymore. Some girlfriends have said to boyfriends. Okay, well, hold on, hold the phones for a minute. I That wasn't a fuck buddy. That was a friend of mine that I've known for years. And I think most people don't really look at that. The integral value of what those people of the life they've had before they got together. It's the same thing that they have a problem with when people say that, you know, once you've had sex, you know, boom, things change. If things change due to sex only, uh, then my whole life has been sex. <laughs> and I haven't had sex yet. Because my whole life has changed me. So, it's a big joke when people try to pattern things based on this physical realm. The physical realm is very important, but just as much the dive deep below, the spiritual underground and up up above, whatever you want to call it, these things are flagrant images of what we believe is up and down. I got rid of that a long time ago because up and down is the same thing as looking at left and right, Republican and Democrat. Motherfuckers don't even stand on my back. And I think that's what the difference is between what people want to use as the device to say, this is what we should look at. I don't think this is what we should look at at all. Because it creates more of the problems. It creates that upper hand that people always want to take. It creates, God save the system. <laughs> God save the system, really. I don't want the system to be saved. No thanks. Let it die. Turkey at least knew that. Let it die. <laughs> you know, self-defense mechanism, cynicism, sarcasm. Saying, uh, you insult my intelligence when it's really you're insulting your own intelligence. So it's impossible in this world to empathize with others, but we can always empathize with ourselves. Well, that's good. It's a good start. Um, and as I said, you know, I can never show you something that you can show yourself. There you go, you know. I'm not really afraid of anything, you know, and I think that's good. I'm scared of everything I'm scared of. I'm scared of everything, but I'm not afraid of... You know, I'm the death king. I'm not afraid of love, therefore I'm not afraid of death. Not to say there's a parallel between love and death, but there's a parallel of being afraid of love and death. They're both basically doing, talking about the same dual subjects. When subjects are, fear, uh, are feared or put in a position of being afraid of in, in the same way, it's like being scared to death, you know. I wouldn't be. Because... I could be scared, but what death am I going to be scared of? It's something that's going to happen, you know? And I think that's what really I mean by this empathy. you got to have empathy for yourself if you're not going to. Who's going to? Someone else is going to have it for you the same exact way you want it, but you're not allowing yourself to get to it. So it's not saying that people don't need relationships so they can find every answer on their own. It's not even that. Like, I think too many people base the subject of what a relationship is on something they can't do for themselves too much. That it's not really about that. Sometimes it's about having that companion, having that person you want to be with. Having that person you feel a lot for. And that's what I do it for. Feelings, emotions, sensitivities, senses, guts, instincts, everything. The sensitivities are strong. You know, it's, it doesn't have to do with... It, it can do with energy, and it does do with energy, but it does with a lot more. Right here in the physical plane, in the spiritual plane, everything that finds that connection, it finds it. I'm not going to use something in this world to just, you know, say, this is the concrete yes or no about it. But a lot of people would maybe say that about it. That maybe Marcello did it for the, these reasons or those reasons. Go ahead, you know. Same thing that I've heard before, you know. It's the same thing that happened a uh, couple last year or so with uh, Christina when she was saying, oh, you know, uh, about fall in love with Catherine. She was saying that, you know, you should know better than to fall in love with Catherine. Okay, but I didn't. Can't tell me not to, you know. And if you have to bring it up to me, and she doesn't, 
then there's a problem. Because <laughs> she's not saying that to me. So, why are you telling me I can't fall in love? I shouldn't be falling in love with somebody like that. Why isn't she telling me this? There's obviously something that you're not, that, that, that she's seeing, or that you're seeing that she's not seeing. Because literally, if she's not seeing it, then you don't have to worry about, about anything at all. Because if it's one-sided, it's one-sided. I'm not going to be on fire about it. I know how I feel. That's all. And that's always how I feel. Marcello's in this whole thing between Death King and Rambling but Pink Cloud, but there's nothing else. Babbling and nervous laughter will get me everywhere, but nowhere. <laughs> but middle of nowhere and lost. But it's lovely this way. No passes to pay, no privilege to get. Just living my life and not being upset. So take care all, and have a good day.